Hey guys, September the 2nd today, Labor Day in some parts of the world. 2013, just sitting out by the garden. This is not going to be a garden video, I have a lot to discuss. Uh, it's been several days since I did a video and there's a lot going on right now. So, um, As always, if you're not interested in the stuff I'm talking about, just don't watch it. These are my organic orange heirloom tomatoes and they're coming along. Those aren't quite full size yet, they get a bit bigger and obviously they need to ripen but I'm looking forward to having some of those in a few weeks. Talking currencies now, here's a two-year chart of the rupee versus the US dollar. So uh, when it's going down, that indicates that the US dollar is gaining in value against the rupee. And when it's going up, that's indicating that the rupee is gaining value against the US dollar. I use the US dollar just because it's a very common currency to base other things on, but you could look at this in terms of anything else, really. Uh, but just have a look at what's happened over the past two years. Started up here and has gone down to here recently. A really nasty drop, and you've been hearing about it ever since about here. You've been hearing the last couple of months, you've been hearing about India's drop, and that's that right there. But this represents a very, very large drop. Um, it's really significant when a currency moves at all. And uh, this is an, a massive currency move. This is like losing one third of their purchasing power over the past couple of years. Imagine if uh, everything that you owned lost one third of its value, just like that. This is important because India is a major player and is becoming more of a major player in terms of the global marketplace. So uh, they have a lot of gold in that country. They import a lot of gold, well, they used to. <laughs> it's banned now, but uh, traditionally they they buy a lot of gold and they import a lot of gold and uh, their currency is something to watch. It indicates that something major is going on right now. Here's a long-term Bitcoin chart. Just a reminder, Bitcoin is currency, not money, but it is a pretty good currency. And I talk about it because it's interesting to me and because I think it's a learning experience. If you're not interested, don't watch this part. Uh, Bitcoin is at about 145 right now. Uh, we can zoom into the daily chart. And uh, a couple weeks ago, it was about uh, this consolidation here, just above $100. And I said, I think Bitcoin's going to go to 150 pretty quick, uh, relating to the rupee falling and thinking that there might be some people in India who are no longer allowed to buy gold. And also their stock market is crashing and the rupee is crashing as well. So where are they going to put it into? This might be uh, a possible idea. We've had three legs up since then, and we're in a bit of another consolidation here at about 145 it reached 149 yesterday so um, it does look as if this is accelerating and if things in Syria continue to escalate and if India continues to have its troubles with currency and stuff this could probably be 170 to 200 in the next couple of weeks um, but that said who knows what's going to happen with Syria and India as expected, the U.S. Mint did not update today. This is the first Monday in about 10 Mondays that they did not. They were following that pattern because it suited them. Uh, for the last couple of months, there were only four Mondays in the month, so that allowed them to report less sales. Now there's five Mondays in September, so they will not be reporting on Mondays anymore, as I mentioned last week. So they did not update today. And people will say, well, it's Labor Day. Eh, that's true. But in the past, the Mint has updated on Christmas Day, you know, at three in the morning and stuff like that. It's just whenever they want to update. They don't have to, it doesn't have to be office hours. Someone can do this remotely or whatever. Uh, so they can update this whenever they want to. It's all very, very timed. And that's become more apparent to me as I've watched it very closely over the past uh, nine months or so now. But yeah, they did not update. And we can take this over to the graph that we've been working on. This graph tracks Silver Eagle sales over the past 27 years in orange, that is the best possible January, February, March, etc. over the past 27 years, and in green is 2013. So here we have August, as you can see, it came down just below the all-time record, and therefore was not a record-setting month. There's no headlines, etc., etc. And what's going to happen for September, I've already drawn it in, it was a really good month back in 2011. One of the best months of all time, in fact. So we are currently selling at about 1 million ounces a week. And depending on how they report this month, uh, I would expect it to probably come up and just about, but not quite, break that record 
as it did here, as it did here, as it did here, and as it did here. But overall, if you look at the year, uh, which I will do in a moment, you can see that this is by far the all-time best year ever for Silver Bullion. And this graphs the demand or sales of Silver Eagles uh, over different years from 2000 on. And this different colored bar is this year, or at least two-thirds of this year. Two-thirds of the year have passed. We're now tied with 2012. We're about to surpass 2010. And we're just barely, um, maybe a month away from passing 2011. And uh, once again, I will estimate that we will reach about 47 million Silver Eagle sales. And just uh, to give you an idea of how many ounces 47 million is, the U.S. mines 30 million ounces of silver each year. Last graph for right now. This is the silver price versus demand chart over the past 13, 14 years. And uh, this is last month's edition, actually. I'm not going to bother doing up the data for this. Uh, the only difference is, let's get a little brush going here. Price has come up very slightly and demand has also risen very slightly so the overall divergence is just as wide as it was uh, I'm not going to bother redrawing the chart at this time because it's just not that dramatic and uh, it's not changing as much as we get further and further into the year the chart changes less each time I do it um, just because of the way the numbers work so but yeah the divergence is still intact demand is still at record pace and price is still at record lows so that's all we really need to say about that Speaking of mint sales figures, the Royal Canadian Mint doesn't publish like the U.S. Mint does. Uh, they just publish about every, I think, three months, and then they publish a yearly one every year. And it's always a couple of months behind the actual time that the data was collected. So it's not really useful for analyzing things like uh, looking at the supply and demand divergence, for example. But it is useful to look at this um, when they do release it. So I'll put the link down below if you're interested. A couple of things I want to point out about it though are, um, one, the Mint is really gloating about their profits and about how they're taking money essentially away from the people of Canada. They're talking about how much money they're saving by not producing pennies anymore. They're talking about all the money and profit they're making by having all those coin machines in banks and other supermarkets and stuff like that where you can dump your old coins and they'll give you, you know, digital uh, fiat credits for it. And uh, they're talking about all that recycling that's going on, all that copper, all that nickel uh, that's coming back into the coffers and being sold and of course uh, that money is turned over to the government of Canada it does not go um, back to the people that's just it's just lost it's just taken from the people and and lost and squandered essentially uh, they talk about how they're producing so many steel coins now nothing of any real value they're maximizing the face value that they can put on their coins and minimizing the actual metal that has to go into them. Now they're saying there's almost nothing of any value and they're celebrating that fact. It's almost as if they're saying it's a good thing. The Mint used to be a place where, you know, refineries sent their huge trucks full of metal and then the Mint distributed it to the people of the country. That's what a Mint was, but now it's almost exactly the same. It's like the Mint is taking the metal away from the people and giving them paper promises and fiat digital units. They go on to say that they have sold a lot of limited edition steel coins with little fake crystals in the center and stuff like that, and they're charging 80 bucks a coin, and because there's only 80,000 of them minted, then, you know, the numismatics are at an all-time high, and people are piling in, and, and uh, they talk about how the 20 for 20 coins have, you know, really were worthless in terms of their melt value. They have about a quarter of an ounce of silver and they cost almost an ounce of silver, but they're also bringing in a lot of new customers into the numismatic market with those silver coins. And then there's luring them in with the silver coin that has very little silver value anyway. And then they're switching it up for steel coins that they mint for nothing. Essentially it costs them maybe half a cent to make one of these coins and they're selling it for fifty dollars because it's limited edition. It's pretty bad. It's pretty sick to read this stuff. But uh, this is the the page that really is more interesting and they talk about how bullion sales are up double over the previous uh, period in last year in 2012. So the same period that we're up double uh, gold is actually up 2.5 times higher in terms of sales, gold maple leaves. Uh, 
two and a half times, when something increases two and a half times in a year from an already record high, you gotta take notice. And silver's up from four million ounces to 6.4 in the same, so that's what, um, 1.6 times more, so it's an increase of 160%. It's really, really big. Overall, bullion sales are double what they were this time last year, and last year was a record year, so uh, something is really up. Perhaps you recall that in Cyprus, depositors' money was confiscated in order to stabilize the banks. Similar plans are already in place to do the same in the U.S. and other countries. I got this video link from someone he knows who he is. Thanks for sending that along. Uh, I put it on my favorites list. I think it's quite a good video. It came out, I think, earlier today or yesterday. Um, it's been seen by 11,000 people already, but uh, I think it's going to be a pretty good video to show friends and family who perhaps aren't aware about bail-ins, aren't aware that they can happen here, not just in Cyprus, but uh, the plan is for them to happen in all Western countries and pretty much the entire world. Uh, over the next couple of years. So if you have anything in the bank, it might be a good idea now to make sure that you don't have anything in the bank. Um, whether or not you keep it in cash or you convert it to something more stable in the long term, uh, store of value like precious metals or something else, real estate, anything else uh, that can't be bailed in, uh, that might be a good idea to do. And this is probably the kind of video you can share with friends and family. It doesn't even mention silver and gold. It just lays out the case that bail-ins can happen, and it shows you exactly how that's already a reality. So the link is below. Just very briefly, I want to show you what happens if you try and leave a video response to a video. Now, up top of the screen, you see, attention, on September 12th, we are removing existing video responses from the watch page and disable creation of new video responses and you can learn more. It just essentially says that video responses are going away, so YouTube is no longer a place where you can have a conversation by video or a debate by video. It's only a place where you can post random videos that have no connection to other videos. That's great for big channels like Jenna Marbles and stuff like that that talk about dogs and sell coffee mugs and stuff like that, but uh, it's not really that great for channels which usually happen to be smaller channels that focus more on uh, community having uh, conversations, stuff like that. So this is just another step that YouTube is taking to make it so that their website is better for uh, revenue generating mainstream channels and not as good for other channels. Perhaps you've seen coins like this before. This is a Mexican coin. Uh, that's a very common design for Mexican coins going back a very, very long time. Um, doesn't really matter who's on that side, but that's a very common design for them. Anyway, these coins come in all kinds of different shapes and sizes, denominations, um, metal types, and I usually just pick them up cheap um, as a throw-in on another deal or whatever, or if I'm in a coin store and they're, you know, uh, 10 cents bin or whatever, I'll look through and I'll find any piece that appears to be uh, a real monetary metal like copper or nickel, and just, you know, it doesn't really hurt much to spend 10 cents and throw it away for uh, my kids in the future, but uh, this time I got it one that I hadn't seen before. It's a 1958, and it's a one peso, and in the past I've gotten ones that were like 5,000 pesos, 1,000 pesos, stuff like that, so for it to be one peso and it to be that size seemed a little bit odd to me, so I thought maybe that actually has some silver in it. It does. It's 0 0.100 silver, so 10% silver, and I assume the rest is uh, cupro nickel, copper and nickel, but I stack copper and nickel too, and uh, that's an interesting mix. I don't think I have any 0 0.100 coins in my collection at all, uh, but yeah, that's a, a real piece of money. Back in 1958, I guess they were still using a bit of silver in Mexico. Mexico has a lot of silver, as you know, and uh, they're still pulling a lot out of the ground there. But uh, yeah, that was a nice little find there. I got it essentially for free, and uh, I have a new scale. How do you like it? Anyhow, it is 15 grams, so it's approximately half an ounce. Yeah, it's about half an ounce, just over half an ounce. Um, actually, it's exactly half an ounce right now. It was 0.55 last time I checked, but yeah. But um, yeah, just. Um, if you see coins and you're in a coin store and it's actual monetary metal and it's cheap 
um, don't hesitate to grab a handful of that stuff. If you got an extra couple of dollars, you can walk home with a good bag of metal. And uh, as long as you don't live the vagabond lifestyle and plan on moving everything with you every day, if you've got somewhere to put it, um, there's really no harm in it. While I'm down here on the floor, I'll show you my uh, large penny stack as it is right now. You've seen these before, I'm sure. Um, a lot of different countries in the world use these uh, massive pennies. They're about a third of an ounce each. They're huge. Um, 98 or 95 percent copper. And uh, if you put 48 of them together, then it adds up to exactly one pound. And conveniently, it fits perfectly in the Royal Canadian Mint tubes, which I get for free, and I have tons of them. So uh, these are ones are Great Britons. They're the most popular one I've found, but uh, I do have some miscellaneous ones as well. Um, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, France, all kinds of different countries have used that exact same uh, copper blank in the past for their coins. But uh, yeah, I just, I'm just putting them aside for my kids. I get them pretty much for nothing. Um, they're an attractive little coin. I just wash them up. I don't care about the numismatic value. I just wash them up and throw them in here. And uh, I'll stack them away for my kids. This is actually for free. I wish my parents had put aside some junk silver for me when it was, you know, available for next to nothing at face value or, or even less sometimes. But um, they didn't. And I'm going to do it for my kids with copper. Let's throw one of these on the scale just for fun because I've got a new scale. And we'll do it in pounds once it's zeroed. There we go. Zero pounds. And. Oh, that didn't work how I wanted it to work, did it? Oh, get them all on there. There we go. It's exactly one pound. Check out these gold bars I got. Okay, they're chocolate bars, but still. Uh, just about as good, right? I got a bunch of different kinds. Some uh, milk chocolate, some dark chocolate, you know, some with nuts. I couldn't even get them all on the screen here to show you, but I got a heck of a lot. And uh, the local supermarket had them on for 99 cents, so... Um, they're a pretty big chocolate bar. I've had them before. They're good chocolate. This brand happens to be, it's a no-name brand um, from the supermarkets here, but happens to be actually a really good no-name brand. Almost everything they make is quite good and uh, better than no-name brands. So I've stacked up quite a bit of chocolate. Uh, the way I do my food storage is I eat what I stack and I stack what I eat. So um, there's never any wastage. I make sure I know what the expiry dates and things are. I know how quickly I would go through this number of chocolate bars. Uh, this is probably enough to last me a couple of years. I don't eat chocolate every day, but um, it's a nice treat to have around sometimes. And uh, you're never going to have a chocolate bar and say, you know, I wish that I didn't have that chocolate bar. I wish I had that 99 cents back. Because these, of course, usually go for 250 or whatever. They're a pretty big chocolate bar. So uh, now I can have a chocolate bar that I bought at rock bottom prices. They never go down to 99 cents, maybe once every couple of years. So I have enough now to last me until the next time they're that price. And when you do that with food, you're always eating the food that you bought at the lowest possible price. Make sure you never waste anything. Make sure you never let anything go past the expiry date. Know how long food keeps. Don't buy, you know, like a million pounds of bananas or something like that. You know, you gotta be realistic. You gotta know what you're doing. But if you do it right, you can eat essentially everything you eat at sale prices. Not only sale prices, but rock bottom sale prices. I have something to say about Syria and some links on that. And I have something to say about Fukushima and some links on that. But I think I'll put that in a different video because it's kind of a different topic. And this one's getting rather long. So I will leave it there. Talk to you guys soon.